All right, if you would, open up your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 12. Genesis, chapter 12. Last week we started in, uh, Brother Ray was talking about Abraham and the life of Abraham. And when we left Abraham last week, he was in a great spot. Remember, God had called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. He said, I want you to go to a place that I will show you. Now, guys, let me ask you this. How many of you are willing when you're on a trip and you don't know where you are to stop at a gas station and ask directions? Okay. Pam, I was asking the guys. I'm sorry. You know, uh, I know you would do that, but, you know. Uh, yeah, for some reason, guys are just uh, notorious about if they're lost, they don't want to stop and ask directions because they're making such good time, you know. And so that's one of the, one, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like that, Brother Bob. I, I hate to ask because I figure if I drive around long enough, I'm bound to end up somewhere. And so, uh, but here Abraham was willing to say, okay, I'll go wherever you lead. And of course, we saw last week as Brother Ray brought us through those verses, how that God led Abraham into the land of Canaan. Uh, and then he, he made some promises to Abraham. I'm going to bless you. You're, you're going to be a blessing to all the nations. I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. But I'm going to make you a great nation. And all the world is going to be blessed because of you. And then he, he had said, you see this land I brought you to? It's going to be yours and your descendants. And, of course, we know that uh, the Bible said, and the Canaanites were there. And Brother Ray talked a little bit about that. But when we left last week, uh, Abraham, or as he was known as Abram at that point, but Abram was worshiping God. He had built an altar uh, there between Bethel and Ai. Now, Bethel was on, on the one side, and, of course, uh, that meant what? Anybody remember? House of God. House of God. And Ai meant? He didn't tell us. But uh, Ai meant heap of ruins. Isn't that wonderful to be stuck between the house of God and a heap of ruins? You know? But this was a good place for Abram to be. Because he worshipped God there. The heap of ruins reminded him of what life uh, without the Lord was. And the house of God, Bethel, reminded him of who he wanted to worship. And so we see that he had built an altar and worshipped the Lord there. Okay, that's where we left Abram. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the confidence that we can have even in the face of fear. How many of you have ever been afraid of something? Okay. Anybody know what the, what the pastor is afraid of? Snakes. That's right. So if you... <laughs> no, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't even mention that. But at any rate, you know, a lot of times we have all uh, encountered fears. You know, uh, my dad was afraid of heights. Matter of fact, when he came down to visit us in Brazil, we decided to take him over to Rio de Janeiro. And we went up on Christ the Redeemer mountain. The way up there, of course, you're driving along this road that as you look out the side, it's a, it's a drop-off, Okay. And I'd, I'd forgotten about my dad's fear of heights. And so as we're driving up there, of course, his side of the car, as he's looking out the window, by the time we got up to the top, my dad 
without saying a word, we, we got out of the car, and he fell to his knees. He was that fearful, you know. He just fell to his knees, and he kept apologizing. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've embarrassed you. I said, no, Dad. A bunch of people are on their knees up here. You know, it's just, it's just something that happens. Everybody thinks you're just fitting in. It's great. But, uh, you know, a lot of times we face fears, don't we? And here we're going to take a look at Abram tonight and some of the fears that he had to face we're going to see were of his own making. But I think it's important for all of us to learn some lessons from Abram tonight uh, by observing the steps that he took. We're going to look at three different steps that he took. And so I think we can learn some important lessons for our lives today by looking at Abram's decisions that he made. Okay, we left him last week worshiping God. Notice verse 9. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to uh, sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Okay. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when we have, when, when the Lord has provided a great victory in our lives, how that sometimes Satan will come in right after that and try to tempt us? and to try to drag us down. Realize that last week when we ended, Abram had made this trip following only God. God told him where to go. God had brought him into this land, and Abram was just so happy that he worshiped the Lord. And God had made some very important promises to him. And now we see that Abram's on the move again. What do you notice that's missing in this move? Okay. Yeah. Who told him to go? Where does it say that God said, okay, Abram, now it's time to move on. Let's go south. We don't see that. What we see is that Abram decided to go. But it, he was not listening to what God had to say, or he wasn't even inquiring of God, from what we can see here. And we see that there was a famine in the land. Now, Abram had, had a pretty, pretty substantial bunch of livestock, a famine, of course, he had. He was responsible for a number of people too, in you know that he gathered servants and that. We're going to see he's going to get more, but uh, at this point, a famine comes up, and the Bible says it was a grievous famine. It was a hard famine, and the first thing that Abram thinks of is, "Oh, I need to do something. I need to do something." Do you ever find yourself in a position where either something has come up and the first thing you think about, what should I do about this? If we would have seen Abram, you know, if he would have continued on in the way he'd been going last week, what do you think would have been his first thought? Let's go talk to God. Let's see what God thinks. Here's a famine. I'm, I'm a little fearful of this famine. Let's talk to God. Let's see what God wants me to do. What should I do? But instead, the Bible doesn't tell us any of that. It says that he sojourned toward the south, which was toward the Negev, which was more desert. And we see for the first time in the Bible the mention of Egypt. Okay? Okay. Egypt is going to be mentioned in the Bible over 600 times. And normally, uh, it was a picture of the world. It was a picture of, of what was not right, okay? It was a picture of, uh, 
a situation that we find much in our world today that uh, it was not godly. They worshipped a number of gods. And so Abram decides to go down to Egypt. He doesn't trust God. He just makes up his mind, let's go that way. And so he does. You know, I think one of the first things that we see is that uh, Abram is taking a step in the wrong direction. Sometimes when we begin to be fearful, we begin to look on how we can manage our lives. And it's so easy to, let, uh, to keep God out of those decisions. We think we've got a better idea. And we're going to see that Abram still keeps coming up with these ideas, okay? But the first step that he takes is let's go down into Egypt. Let's look to the world for the answer that we need instead of looking toward God. And so we see. Verse 11, And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman, woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Okay. So here we come. He's taking his family down into, into Egypt. And he, he takes a look at his wife, and he says, Wow, you're good looking. You know? Do you remember how old she was at this time? She's 65. Okay? She's 65. Jim, you're kind of giving me that expression. He thinks a 65-year-old woman's looking good? Well, of course he would. You know, I... I look at my wife, who is not 65, and I think she's pretty good looking, okay? I'm trying to make up brownie points from what I said Sunday when she wasn't here. Okay, so as, as you look at this, you know, he's looking at his wife, and she must have been, you know, she must have been working out at uh, one of the gyms or something. And uh, he says, wow, you are good looking. And if we go down into Egypt... There's going to be someone, there's going to be people there that are going to notice how good looking you are. And as a result, they're going to say, hey, this is this guy's wife. I think she would make a great person to be my wife. So what can I do about this? Oh, let's kill her husband. You know, that's what's going through Abram's mind. Do you see how he's trusting God? No. He's not. Once again, he's running through in his own mind, trying to come up with a, a good way of getting through this situation. He's fearful because he said, they'll kill me, but they'll keep you alive. So what does he think? He said, I've got an idea. Notice uh, verse 13. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Okay. Michael, you're shaking your head. You're, you're, you're wondering, okay, what, what in the world? You know? Okay. <laughs> Can't you picture Larry saying something like this? No, no. no n n never happened. Okay. If Larry were crazy enough to come up with this idea, w what would you do? You'd kill him. Okay, good. Uh, we have a wild crew here tonight, and, uh, you know, it's a little fearful. I'm fearful now being up here. Uh, but, you know, the idea was, I think any wife would say, What? What, what are you talking about? Because you're saying basically uh, you're kind of getting 
pushing me out to the forefront and saying, here, take her. Because it'll keep me alive. Okay? That's what's going on. Do you see the problem with that? I, you know, if, if <laughs> my wife would kill me, you know, if I would have said something like that. Uh, this, was a, this was a situation. Now, here's the interesting thing. When you look in chapter 20, and I think it's around verse 12, you're going to see that what Abraham is saying here is a half-truth. Because Sarah was his half-sister. Okay, that's what it's talking about. So, actually, he wasn't really lying, was he? Yeah, he was. Have you ever noticed that a half-truth is really a whole lie? You know, but isn't it amazing that when you begin to be fearful and you begin to let the, your, your, your wheels spin in your mind, you come up with things that you spin it just the right way. I'm so glad that we don't know what that spin is today in our media or government or anything like that. Boy, there's so much spinning they will take any story and spin it in such a way to make something that is wrong sound right. That's what Abram is doing. You see, as you take, as you take these steps, notice that he's, he's traveling away from Bethel. He's traveling away from the house of God. He's traveling in the opposite direction. He's going down into what the Bible will uh, allude to many times as going into the world, going down into Egypt. And as he's coming into this, he's already preparing his lies. Don't tell them you're my wife. So this was his better idea. Okay. Well, it really works out well, doesn't it? Look at verse 14. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. So they're going, whoo, wow, hey, she's a good-looking woman. Hey, we need to do something about this. So, verse 15, the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Here, Sarah's going to be part of the Pharaoh's harem. Isn't this wonderful? So if you're Sarah, what are you thinking about Abram? <laughs> you, know, you know, how dare you? You know, I'm, I'm your wife. You're supposed to protect me, and you're doing this. And, and what, what do you think if you're Abram? Let me tell you what, what he thought. Okay, verse 16. And he, talking about Pharaoh, entreated, or this means that he treated Abram very well. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. So in other words, can't you imagine Abram sitting there and, of course, his nephew Lot is observing everything that's going on, and Lot's probably thinking, hey, what a haul you got for Sarah. It was a good trade, you know. Aunt Sarah was worth a lot of camels and, and donkeys and a bunch of these animals, and, boy, this is, this is a good deal, you know. And Abram is not saying a word. Notice, as he takes these steps away from where he was, where he was worshiping God at Bethel, after that great victory there, Satan seems to have interjected some things with the famine, scared him, and here we go, Abram is going down into Egypt. 
And each step he takes, it's getting worse. And it's getting worse. And so now his wife has been taken into the harem of Pharaoh. Do you remember the promise that God had made to Abram? I will make of thee a great nation. Okay. Do you remember what Br Brother Ray said last week? Sarah hadn't even had a child yet. But this was the promise that God made. I'm going to make of you a great nation. And instead of Abram believing what God had said, we see he's going in the opposite direction. It makes me wonder, you know, because, boy, I've been guilty of this too. Thinking about the promises of God, and then it was so easy to just go the opposite direction. But, you know, is God, does God keep his promises? Are we confident of that? Okay, so what's God going to do now? I mean, this is a rough situation. God has made these promises. What's he going to do? Notice what happened. Verse 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So here's a plague that started hitting Pharaoh's family. Does this sound familiar? Well, just, just wait till the book of Exodus and you're going to see those plagues come back. But this is, this is way before that ever happened. But something happens. Pharaoh knows that something is not right. How do we know that? I mean, what is it that, who told Pharaoh? We don't know. Who, who uh, uh, how did Pharaoh come across this idea that, hey, Abram and Sarai are involved in this and it's because of them that we're having these plagues. We don't know exactly how he came to know that. But notice verse 18. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou tell me that she was thy why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to be uh, to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her, go thy way. Pharaoh looks at, at Abram and said, What have you done? Why have you done this disservice? What in the world are you doing? Now think about this. Abram would have had the best opportunity before a world leader to, re to represent his God. And what did he do? He went in and told a lie. He came down and thought of his own safety. He didn't think about his wife. He didn't think about his testimony. And you know what? This is one of the things that if we're not careful, as we face situations in our life, you know what? We can, we can really hurt our testimony. People are watching us. And they're wanting to see what the difference is in a normal or a, a, a person in the world and a person that calls himself a Christian. Abram would have had the opportunity if he'd done what was right in the first place, he might have had the opportunity to witness to someone like Pharaoh and told him about the great God, the great creator God. But instead, Pharaoh says, why have you done this? Why have you done this? I've been kind to you because I thought this was your sister. I've given you a number of things, and you've done this to me. Here, here's your wife. Go. Get out of here. 
Verse 20, And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Pharaoh was so upset with Abram and his family. He said, get them out of here. I don't want them around. Boy, wouldn't that be a terrible testimony? That if we would find ourselves not trusting God in our daily lives, you know, we can, we can hurt the cause of Christ by lying, by being deceitful, by not representing our Lord and Savior the way we should. That was the, another step that Abram had taken. He didn't listen to God, didn't ask him for directions, and then he just kept going further and further and making another decision and another decision, and it brought him to this point that he was tossed out of Egypt. Ruined his testimony because of it. But you know, I'm glad the story didn't end there. Can't you imagine Abram now? He's looking at the situation. Where he had been was Bethel, and he worshiped God. Great victory. He had followed the Lord's leadership out of the earth of the Chaldees, and the Lord had brought him to a place and then made wonderful promises to him. And then because of the famine, because of the fear, Abram starts walking on his own instead of following God. But notice, when he gets tossed out of Egypt, what's his next step? Verse 1, chapter 13. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. So now they start the journey, and they start going back to the north. They, they, they get into the south there of Canaan, there in the Negev, and they have all this, you know, they have more cattle than they had. They have more sheep, more camels, more donkeys, more servants because they had been they had been gifted these things when they were in Egypt because because of Pharaoh thought this is your sister and notice that Pharaoh didn't take any of this stuff back he just said get out of here go and so now they're they're heading where are they heading notice Verse 2, and Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai. You know, isn't this a wonderful thing? Abram came to his senses. Because now we see the step, instead of going in the wrong direction, now he's going in the right direction. Why? He knew he needed to get back to where he had been. Where that place of worship, that place of victory, he knew that he had taken the wrong steps. You know, many times as we are fearful in our lives and we begin to to come up with ways of trying to work things out ourselves. We can find ourselves in a mess. It's only when we turn our attention back to the Lord and seeking to be back where we need to be with Him that things begin to give us that confidence once again. Even in the midst of, of fears... Do you think that God couldn't take care of Abram in that famine? Basically, that's what Abram thought. Could God take care of him? Yes. Isn't it easy to condemn Abram, though? Can God take care of us in a famine? 
And it could be any type of fear that we have. Can God take care of us? And you know, isn't it kind of easy for us to sit there and go, yeah, yeah, he can, until the time something happens in our lives and we're confronted. What are we going to do? So many times we try to think, okay, how do I get myself out of this? When our thoughts should be, Lord, I want to follow your example. I want to seek your wisdom, your strength. Lord, I want to follow your guidance. Lord, I have confidence in you. I don't have confidence in me. Lord, help me. Help me to walk according to your leadership. And so that's what we see that Abram does. He goes back to Bethel. He goes back to that altar. Notice verse 4, and we're done. Under the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. He'd gone full circle. He got looking at things, and he thought, you know, this is pretty good. You know, I've made this trip all the way from the Ur of the Chaldees, and I've been promised a lot of things, and God's given us victory, and this is wonderful, and I can worship God. And then he thought he was self-sufficient. And then he began to take those steps away from God. But God brought him back to where he had been at the first. And God brought him back to doing what he had done, and that was to worship God. You know, our fears can be very real. But when we stick with God, he'll give us direction even in those fears. Now, are you happy that Abram's made it back to Bethel? Okay, you know, I am too. I am too. Uh, now, you know what this shows me is that Abram wasn't perfect. Now, I know I'm talking to a lot of perfect people here tonight, okay? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're not perfect. We're going to have some, some trials that come our way, some difficulties that come our way. But you know, our eyes need to be fixed on Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. You see, because when we begin to step away like Abram, now Abram came back and, and, you know, the Lord is gracious. He received Abram back. I'm, I, I'm, <laughs> I don't see in these verses where God said, well, it's about time. And I don't see where God said, oh, Great, you expect me to help you now? I see God's gracious arms, just like that prodigal son. When, when the father saw the son coming, even from a distance, ran out there and threw his arms around that young prodigal, his son, and he kissed him, and he kissed him. This boy smelled like a pig pen. And, and the boy is trying to say, Father, I've sinned against you. I've and the father wouldn't hear any of it. He just kissed him and hugged him and said, Welcome back, my son. But do you know what? Abram still had some consequences for the steps that he had taken away. We're going to find out. It was down in Egypt where he picked up a maidservant for his wife, Sarah. Her name was Hagar. That's going to cause some problems. Also, when he was down in, in Egypt, he, he, he had many cattle and sheep, and, and it was in, you know, it got to be bigger flocks. That's going to create a problem with his nephew Lot. Had he stayed where he was at Bethel, 
he might not have had to deal with these problems. You see, there are consequences when we take steps away from God. God still welcomes us back. He still says, oh, it's so good to have you here. But we need to be careful that we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Don't take the steps away. Follow after Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time.